Welcome to the From Met to Yeah profile for this week. And this week we're going to be having Karen Furnow, a three-time Olympian, two-time world champion. And what I, I want to start to explore with Karen is really where um, the drive came from, where the passion that, I, and I know Karen, and I know every time you meet her, it's like an explosion of energy. So I just want to see where is all of that coming from that has set on this path of just so yes to life. Now, this, uh, this show, just to let you know, it comes every Monday on Facebook Live, uh, and then it'll be on, on my stream. You can also get it as a podcast on iTunes or Google Play or Stitcher. So if you just go to my website, ravitangri.com, uh, you, you can click right on the link there and, and get that if you prefer it in podcast format. So right now, I want to move to uh, our, our uh, guest this uh, this week, Karen Furneaux, who, as I said, is a uh, three-time Olympian, two-time world champion. And I'm like, oh my God, Karen, like, the, you look at the bio on you and the recognition, the awards just keep going. Uh, uh, it's, it's incredible. So welcome aboard. Thank you so much, Ravi. It's my pleasure. My pleasure to be here this afternoon. Thank you. So for people who may be new or not as familiar with you, can you share a little bit about what, what your journey has been and, and so on in terms of to the Olympics and what you, where you've been in that progress? Absolutely. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm really happy to be here this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to share a little bit about my uh, sport history first and then chat about my transition a little bit from sport into um, well, through education and then into my career. Um, so my sport career was uh, super successful and super fun. I was honored to represent Canada for nearly 20 years um, on the world scene. Um, so competing at three different Olympic Games, uh, 17 different world championships and uh, Pan American Games. Um, but before all of that, I was uh, just a regular kid and just... I loved to be on the water on Lake Thomas at Chima, which is my home club. And I guess, Ravi, you asked the question earlier, um, where, does the, where does that drive come from? And for me, it started when I was a little girl, when I was about eight years old. Um, I was a gymnast at the time, and I was always the smallest kid in gym class. Um, so, you know, always picked last on teams. Um, so right from a young age, I knew I had to work really hard um, to make, you know, to make some progress in sport. And paddling for me was just this awesome feeling of freedom. I loved being on the water. I loved being in nature. Um, and eventually that kind of grew to me setting some goals. And my first initial goals were just small, smallish kind of goals. And they were just simply to, you know, make the final at our local regatta and uh, to make it down the course going straight. That's, uh, that, was, that was my first challenge. I remember being in a race on Pisquid, um, which is in Windsor. Uh, it's one of the clubs in Windsor, Nova Scotia. And I took this boat and it was the Blue Jag and it was the tippiest boat in the whole club. And I wanted to take it because I knew I could stay up in it and I could make it go really fast. Well, on this day at this regatta, and I was probably about 12 years old, um, my steering broke in that boat. And I remember just making the race, like weaving back and forth and back and forth down the race course. So eventually I got into some more challenging races and I eventually learned how to make that boat go straight. But I guess that, that, that determination, that grit for me came at a young age. Um, again, it was around being small and wanting to just work really hard um, to get better. So now you didn't go straight into, you know, into the, the, this area because you started out with um, skiing, with gymnastics. Skate, I mean, you were quite an athlete. So what was it? for you that made you really say, okay, this is where I have the fire. What, what for you was that, that telling moment that, that said, yeah, this is where I want to put my energy. Yeah. For me, that moment was so clear 
at uh, my first Junior Worlds was in the Czech Republic and in a little town not far from Prague called Ratchica. And I remember being at the course and it was my first international race. And I I actually not expected to make that team. I kind of made it as a surprise. I was actually going for our Canada Games team. And uh, surprisingly in a race in Ottawa, I ended up second and named to the Junior Worlds team. But in that race in the Czech Republic, I remember just suiting up and suiting up for me meant this amazing, powerful feeling. Just like, And it was this crappy red t-shirt but it was I was so proud um I was so proud of that t-shirt you know it's not like the technical gear that we wear today paddling but back then it was literally a cotton t-shirt it was screened Canada on the back and the maple leaf on the on the chest and I was just so so proud and for me that was the moment that I knew I wanted to represent Canada at the Olympics in kayaking I knew from when I was eight I wanted to go to the Olympic Games um, okay. But as, as you mentioned, I, I dabbled in a lot of different sports, gymnastics, um, cross-country running, ski racing, swimming, um, but I knew that my, in that moment it was definitely going to be in kayaking. So, okay, so when you were eight, you knew when you wanted to be an Olympian. So let's, let's get into that. Where, I mean, how, I mean, how many eight-year-olds are thinking? I mean, there's lots of dreams, of course, eight-year-olds have. Eight year olds have, but what triggered that and made you what where was the fire in that that let you keep it versus oh, this would be a cool little thing to do? Um, for me, I was, I was involved in gymnastics in gymnastics when I was eight, and so for me, it was just this I had these audacious dreams, and just you know, I remember watching the Olympic Games on TV and just being really, really passionately engaged with what you know, the broadcasters were saying about these athletes and watching these athletes intently. And we made it a family thing. Like my sisters and I always used to watch the games together with my mom and dad. Um, and it was just this really special feeling. And, and I remember being in grade three at school and having this conversation with my, my grade three teacher um, about my gymnastics. And she just really, really engaged me in listening um, to my stories and I was kind of sharing her with her the moves I was learning in gymnastics and the competitions that I was doing and stuff like that. No, I wasn't a, a good gymnast by any means, but in my mind, I was this fantastic gymnast and, uh, and but anyway, so Miss Fair was my teacher and she really listened to me and um, yeah, that's for me, that's I think where that whole yeah, that whole Olympic idea came around was just that I knew just every cell I knew I wanted to do it. Okay. So I want to pull out what we, what you've identified here. There's a few things that, that, that are there. Number one, um, you said, you, so you, at eight, you, you knew you wanted to be an Olympian. There's something in you. That's where the fire came. Second, you had someone that honored you and honored that story. You, no matter where you are at now, they, they gave you that space as opposed to shooting you down of yes, dear, whatever, right? That's it, exactly. And third, something you said earlier was that you didn't just stay focused on the Olympics. When you started out, you were starting with smaller goals that you could really work towards. And then, as you said, you were quite surprised to make it to the world's team when you got there because you were focused on that smaller level goal. That's right. Okay. Interesting. And so let's, let's take a look at that point. When you got on the world, how did that shift your goals? How did that shift what you were focusing on then when you realized that, oh, that the Olympics is actually somewhere within grasp now? So what, can you take me through what happened at that point? Yeah, and I, I always find it's whatever, whatever the goal is, um, you know, what, and for me, that's been my experience. When I have the courage to set a goal, mm -hmm. I never know where that goal is going to lead me through or to, right? Um, but it, I know that, and I, I really deeply know that that journey is worthwhile and of value. And that's really, for me, it's about that process. And I think you never know where the next goal is going to come from and where you're going to, where you're going to set to next um, and where you'll arrive, who, if you'll arrive, but it's just 
the passion of pursuit for me is just, it's really encouraging. And I, I really, I call it the power process. And so there's, you know, the overall goal or the kind of top of the mountain piece that you want to achieve. Um, but then the power process is how to make it real and how to make it your everyday habit, how to make, how to move you a little bit closer towards that goal or down that path or, or whatever the, you know, whatever the journey is. Um, so for me, when I first made that junior worlds team, all of a sudden, and I was racing the K2 and the K4, so the, the double and the four person kayak. And so right away, out of nowhere, after I finished those races, I started setting goals to next year, because there was going to be another junior worlds the next year. I want to race K1 next year, you know, the single. I want to go, I want to, and I had some time standards as well, um, you know, that I wanted to achieve. But all of a sudden, I had this whole new sky open up that I wanted to set more goals towards. So it was just, each goal was this little stepping stone almost, I guess. And um, it took many, many years until I eventually did make the Olympic team. It took me eight years um, from, you know, intensely deciding that this is what I want to do until I actually made my first Olympic team. Um, so tons of training hours, like six hours a day and, you know, all of those things. But it's, it really did have all those little benchmarks. And it, for me, that it's being invested in those benchmarks, in those moments um, that really get you the results. And the, and the results, as I said, you never know what they're going to be or how they're going to be defined. Um, but the value is in that process. And, yeah. and that's really a, a life lesson that I learned from when I was that age. So let's say more about that, because, you know, one thing I always talk about is the goal is not the point, it's the journey. All right. Yeah. So, uh, although it's quite a milestone to get to the Olympics, that's pretty odd. But say more about how, despite the fact that your goal was the Olympics, which is pretty big, that it was that process that, that, that was what gave value to it. Yeah, and also, not only what gave value, but also what gave confidence. In sport, it's, it's so, you know, you, you need to pay attention to moment-to-moment -moment focus and moment-to-moment concentration and confidence and the only way to do that is in the present moment and the present moment is the process right it's not the end goal that's 10 years down the road it's okay what can I do right now what can I do in the next two minutes that's gonna make move me forward towards that finish line or that uh, that journey um, so that's really where I where I um, where I developed as an athlete um, some real strengths is in kind of bringing it back down to that power process and staying really present. Okay. So in terms of that, I mean, as an athlete, um, you get some pretty stark feedback because what, you know, when you hit those goals, that's great, but then it's pretty black and white when you are not placing, when you're not there. So, yeah. What happens at those moments when you, how is it that you come through that as opposed to letting, because for a lot of people, when they see negative results, they just allow that to carry them down. So what allowed you to move through those? What was your journey? What was your process of, of dealing with those times when you didn't hit what you wanted? Yeah, so some of the seasons, you know, I was, or races, or, or for example, you know, when I was kind of transition, going through some tough transitions, I did have those negative results. And I, I really used those negative results to fuel the next goal and to, it kind of like was this hunger where I, where I had more power, more energy. Um, of course, I would take some time to reflect and to reassess, and I would talk about that with my coach and then strategize with him or with our training partners and things like that, you know, what we were going to do next time to make it better. And it was, I it was always that focus of what, what's, what else is coming? Where's the journey coming to take us next? Um, so we you know, where's that next step? And it's, it's more that being present through success and failure failures, or I'll, I'll call them learnings. Um, and it's just, it is that mindset, right? It's that growth mindset as opposed to that fixed result. This is the end of the road. I've failed. That's hard to take. If you take it as part of the learning and part of the journey, 
then there's just more learning to do. Yeah. Well, and, and I think really that's another part, is it not, of about staying present? Because um, if, you know, for what a lot of people do, if something goes wrong, they stay stuck in that moment, which is now the past. Right. And they're not, so what I'm hearing is that you, you were in that, in that moment, but once that moment was done, it's okay, what can we learn to move forward as okay. opposed to staying in the past? Absolutely. I mean, I always allow myself some of that time for reflection and journaling and again, time for assessment with my coach and et cetera. But we do eventually come up with a plan um, and then move forward from there. And that's, that's, I think, where the strength is, is in that present plan. Okay, so there's that assessment piece. There's a couple of things again. Assessment, whether it's a coach or a friend or someone that you can go to, so someone that you can work with to grow from it as opposed to doing it and working alone. Yeah, and well, and now it's a little bit different because you know now I'm retired from sport and I am an entrepreneur. Um, so it's it's you know my competitive landscape has changed a little bit. Um, so I do rely a lot on my own feedback um, these days. So there's value in both. I think definitely there's help. You know, if you have a coach or a friend or or a colleague that you can kind of bounce ideas off of and get that assessment or accountability piece taken care of I think that that is huge but I think there's also tremendous value in doing that piece on your own as well um, and then moving that forward in your own in your own way to do okay yeah. so something else I'd like to extract is sometimes people can make move forward on their goals but then suddenly they hit a point where it can get overwhelming and they retreat so I'm thinking of you know, even before the Olympics, when you first made the Worlds or, you know, the, the K1 at the Worlds. And then when you, I mean, as, you know, a girl from Waverly, <laughs> to suddenly show up there must be, you know, I can't imagine the feelings that were there. And how do you allow yourself to move through that as opposed to be overwhelmed or diminished by that? Yeah, that's really interesting. And it's, you know what, it's, I really think it's about belief and mindset. And I, I am so fortunate that I have had tremendous coaches in my sport career. Um, and I really consider them life coaches, right? They're not just sport coaches. They really are. It's a way of life. And, and um, I think that mindset for me was just encouraged from a very young age my family as well my parents but also my coach who I spent probably the most time with on the water um it just you just you know when you trained in his in chum's group and chum was my coach for 17 years when you were part of his group you just knew you just knew that you had done everything possible that you were among the best and and that when you step on the line or get on that start line and when you kind of pull the nose of the boat into the start gate and you take that breath and you're ready with your paddle to kind of spear the water, when you take that first stroke with that mindset and that belief, you can do anything. Any, anything is possible. When you go to the line and you're questioning, questioning your preparation or questioning, you know, process or, or something like that, then it's a different feeling altogether. You know, you're not totally mentally, physically, psychologically, or emotionally engaged. Um, I think when you when you have that belief factor, it's anything. The sky's the limit. You know, it's it's on. It's race time. And, and that's really, for me, that's always been a strength is to be able to get into that mindset. Um, but that doesn't come without that process and all of that hard, hard everyday work, right? It's, yeah. it's, it, it does come down to that. that and that's the practice. That's the, the dedication, the practice, um, the day-to-day, -day, how you practice is how you're going to perform. And that goes for habit, physical habits, as well as mindset. Well, I mean, you are an expert in sports psychology because that you focused on that in your master's, correct? And, and I did, yeah. yeah. And really, it's, as you said, a lot of that is life psychology as well. Absolutely, yeah. I made the decision after my first Olympic Games in Sydney 
to study in sports psychology because I, so I'd done my undergrad in kinesiology. So studied a lot about the body and training effects and physiology and things like that. And I completely ignored the mind. Um, so after Sydney, I, and my experience in Sydney, I actually raced in hurricane force winds and, you know, conditions that were really extreme. And ha after having battled successfully through that, and then we ended up fifth, I just really appreciated the power of the mind. Um, so I chose to go back to school and study in sports psychology. So would you say the difference now, because everyone's got phenomenal physical conditioning, the difference between gold, silver, bronze, etc., is it physical or is it mental? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, everyone is doing the work. It's, uh, that work component is a given. Um, just, there's just no one that's on that world stage that isn't doing that amount and that volume of work. Uh, it, I, th I really believe it comes down to mindset and a little bit the luck factor. You know, you have to have luck a little bit on your side. But I always say, too, the, it's kind of a bit of cliche, but the harder you work, the luckier, luckier you get. Um, but, yeah, it's, it really is that mindset component and, and putting the whole package together in that two minutes or 40 seconds or whatever the distance of the race is. Yeah. So yeah. we've got a few minutes left. I'd like you to tell me about strong beauty and why that's so, why you're so passionate about that. Yes. Strong beauty is such a, a pleasure for me to be engaged with. It's so I started about a year ago, a girls group um, called strong beauty. And the intention of that group was just to provide some mentorship and some encouragement for young girls um, in the sports arena, but I, I'm recognizing that it's more broad than that um, now uh, in terms of audience. Uh, but it's, it's really to encourage that healthy lifestyle habits, um, positive self-confidence, positive body image, um, community, just that whole in, um, mentorship piece and just having a, a, a collaborative group. And so we, we meet quarterly, um, face to face, and we do some physical activity and some yoga. And then we keep in touch virtually when we don't see each other face to face as well. And uh, yeah, and yeah. now, so now I'm actually, I've been writing and I have um, a book that will be coming out this fall that is all around strong beauty as well. And it's, it's really geared towards girls that are going through some challenge or some transition time in their lives. So for me, that was so such a, an important formative time in my uh, career. And I learned a, a lot of skills to help myself um, kind of journey through those, that time. And I, I really feel it's my responsibility to share it and to share those skills with young girls. Um, I think that there's a bit of a gap in the sports scene and in the school system right now, um, as we know it. And I, I know that I have um, just some, some neat things to share. And I, I, just, I just love engaging with that group, uh, that age group of, of girls and getting them, in, getting them talking, really, and getting them interacting and, and connecting. So let me ask, what is it about that that brings you such joy? For me, it really, it feels like to, have, to provide that platform for girls, it feels to me just like how Miss Fair listened to me when I was in grade three. So when I hear someone, a, a young girl share with me her goal, I'm in, I'm so invested and attentive and listening and just, in, in, you know, just engaged with her because I know how hard it is to A, share that, and B, to, you know, to create the courage to move that forward. And I know how meaningful that was for me to have Miss Fair in my grade three, which was, you know, I was eight years old to 10 years old, um, to be able to be there for me and listen to me. And um, that's who I want to be for, the, for these young girls, is just to be that ear that listens and encourages, encourages their goals in a different way than maybe their parents or their coach or their teachers will. That place of possibility. Yeah, absolutely. And also that, that piece of, you know, even if you're small or from a small town, like that's, you know, that's who I am. And, and I love sharing that piece and, and hearing what girls have to say in response to that. Because a lot of, 
you know, a lot of confidence comes from that perception of yourself and, and your place in, in the world. And uh, I think that, you know, we, we have to work hard to just um, help those mindsets along a little bit. So I can't finish off being the geek that I am without leaving the last line of your bio on your page. And I, I want to ask, I, I hope you've, you've seen uh, the, 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 the new movie, Wonder Woman movie. Yeah. So, I, I yeah. thought, A, not only is it the most, it's one of the best superhero movies around, it's so empowering for women, I think. But I'd like to ask you, why is she your, you know, your <laughs> ultimate? You know what? I grew up watching the Wonder Woman cartoons. Um, I had the Wonder Woman underwears, uh, the whole deal, like the whole set. I just, I, I loved watching her on TV and as a kid. And for me, I pretended that I was her. Um, I, I knew I had special powers. I, you know, I kind of did the whole thing. And it's for me, it was just, yeah, she, she's about that, you know, connecting people and helping people and just that really strong, strong female role. And that's, that's who I think for me, that's who I, I relate to the most. And yeah, I guess that's why I, I find her my favorite superhero. And yeah, the movie was fantastic. I agree. I saw it with my sister about a week ago. So yeah, it's definitely a, one of my favorites. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thank you so much, Karen. This has been absolutely amazing. I mean, you know, just to recap some of the things about, you know, you, you listened to the fire in you and you found someone who would support you as opposed to you know, diminish it or, you know, get you realistic or whatever. So finding that voice, wherever it is that supports you. And then, you know, your goals, you were saying step by step. While you had that, yes, you wanted to be an Olympian. It's, you were focused where you were going, including the not so great stuff. Yeah. And then, you know, and then just, uh, you know, really understanding. You, you, you really came to understand the power of the mind and the attitude and your beliefs in terms of your success. So I think those are some of the points here. I just want to yeah. recap a little. And um, so just to, to let everyone know, this, uh, the, the Meta Yak profile is uh, every Monday at uh, 2 o'clock Atlantic time, which is 10 o'clock Pacific, 1 o'clock Eastern and so on. Follow, follow it around the world for time zones. Uh, Wednesday or Thursday, I do a five-minute nugget show, which is to give you a really powerful uh, tool, just five minutes, bing, bang, bong. And um, the, uh, both of these are available, as I said, on podcasts. If you just go to ravitangri.com, you can, there's a link directly there to iTunes, to Google Play, to Stitcher, and you can get them as podcasts if you want to just listen to them at your convenience and next week on next week's show I'm, I'm excited about this a dear friend of mine mike bash who's one of the founding partners of fedex has been um he and i have done a lot of work with organizational change over the years and such but he's also he and i have done a lot of exploration dif different things about intuition and spirituality he spent a lot of time the last few years exploring intuition is coming out with a new book and so what we're going to explore is intuition in business and life in all these areas. How do you actually make it work? How do you, how do you really move forward with it and, and what can it do? So that's next Monday on the uh, profile show. So thank you all for tuning in and we will see you on Thursday with the nugget show. <laughs>